difference between Protestants and Catholics, and I've been on both sides of the fence so that I know it quite well. And you live in a state where it's you're 3% Catholic and the rest are other things, predominantly fundamentalist Baptist, and so you probably know them very well as also. And I want to start out discussing first the issue of authority, because authority is really the crux of the issue. This is where the division comes about. This is where we are really different. Everything else flows from the issue of authority. When the church says something, when the tradition says something, when the Pope declares something, we have a certain source for authority, and therefore that is what we believe and we do. The Protestant has a different source for authority. They reject our way of thinking. They reject our Pope and our tradition. They reject many of our dogmas and our theology. And so they are going to have a very different source of authority, and this is really where the difference lies. And then we'll talk about some of the things that radiate out from there. After we talk about the authority issue a little bit, I hope they have time, we'll get into what I call the ten zingers. The questions that Catholics get asked, which show the differences very plainly in the questions that you get asked, like, are you born again? And where does it say in the Bible you should pray to dead saints and these kind of things? So I want to start out just with the authority part first. We believe as Catholics that there are th three sources of authority, really two. And the third one is an interpreter. It reminds me of a three-legged stool. You're all sitting on four-legged chairs. You could get away with only three legs, and the stool, the chair would still stand. You take away one more, you're on the floor. The authority that the church believes is like a three-legged stool. The first one is sacred scripture, the inspired, infallible, and errant word of God. It stands unique because it is the only inspired word of God. We have a second leg on the stool, and that is called sacred tradition. It is also the word of God. It also flows from the same spring, the same source. The word of God actually is not a book or a tradition. What is the word of God when you come right down to it? The word of God is a person. It is Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. In the beginning was the word. It doesn't say in the beginning was the Bible. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word of God is primarily a person, and that's where we have to begin. And that person revealed himself to us. And in that revelation, it came in two ways. It came when he revealed himself on earth. He picked 12 men who followed him and became the apostles. And they then taught what they knew about him, and some of it got written down. The part that was taught about him became the tradition. The part that's written down became the scriptures, the New Testament. Now we have in common with the Protestants, the scriptures. Now we have 73 books in our Bible, they have 66, but it's relatively a small difference because we have the same New Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. So what we have in common with them is many things. We have the New Testament in common, though we interpret it differently. We have a belief in Jesus Christ as both God and man we hold in common. We hold the Trinity in common, that there's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons make up one God, not three gods, one God in three persons. Now, we do not hold those things in common with the Jehovah's Witnesses. We do not hold them in common with the Mormons. They call themselves Christians. They are not. They are cults. They are heretics. We call them what they are. When someone denies that Jesus is God, in the flesh, they are a heretic. Flat out, that's what they are. They are incorrect, they are wrong, and a heretic. The church condemned that view back in the early centuries. There's no question about it. The Jehovah's Witnesses are the same. They believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel, and that he is a creature. He had a beginning. They're heretics. They are not any, they don't have things in common. They have the same Bible in common with us, but it's not the same Bible. They've changed it. We read, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Do you know what their Watchtower translation says? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. A God. One of many. They're heretics. 
So we have much in common, though, with the Baptists who are down the street from you and that you work with. We have much in common. We both believe that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood to pay for our sins. How that gets applied to our life, we view differently. But some of the major core beliefs, we hold the same. And therefore, I will link arm in arm with them in public to protest an abortion clinic, to stand against Islam and other religions and Marxism or anything else, that we are Christians. We are fellow Christians believe in Jesus Christ and we stand against the world. But then when it comes down to certain specific things and we're in-house now, now we're going to argue. Usually we don't start it. Usually they start it. Unless it's me. <laughs> then I'll start it. But we have this three-legged stool of sacred scripture and tradition which came from the mouth of the apostles. When the apostles died, public revelation ceased and there was no more revelation that is binding upon us. Everything was given to the apostles. It was like a big cabbage, a big red cabbage if you want to view it that way. It's called the deposit of the faith. And it was both in sacred tradition and in scripture. And the sacred tradition and the scripture was together. And in order to understand it, it takes time. It's not easy to understand everything. Even in the letter of Second Peter, Peter writes and says, but we read the writings of our beloved, brother, our beloved brother Paul, some of them which are hard to understand. Even Peter writes that many people find Paul's writings hard to understand and they twist them to their own destruction. Oh boy, do we see a lot of that. <laughs> but this apostolic deposit reveals itself in two ways. Number one, in a book, and number two, in a sacred tradition that was not written down. But it's the life of the church. <laughs> the life of the, it's in the liturgy. It's in the life of the church. It's in the sacraments. The sacred tradition is there. In scripture, it says that there is tradition. Now, when I was growing up, I was taught that tradition was bad. It was the naughty T word. Catholics have tradition. We have the word of God. We have the Bible. They have tradition. Thank you very much. And that's why we rejected what you had, because you had all these man-made traditions like the Assumption of Mary, the Immaculate Conception, you pray to saints, you have purgatory, all these things you can't find in the Bible. Before we go too much farther, I want to ask the question. When somebody says to you, where do you find that in the Bible? Have any of you ever heard that? Purgatory. Prayer to saints. Where do you find that in the Bible? How do you answer that? <laughs> where do you find the word Bible in the Bible? That's exactly, you're right on the right track. I simply ask, and you should remember this, because this is the way you answer that question. Then you put the opponent on the, on the defensive, and you're sitting at the driver's seat now. You simply say, where do you find in the Bible that you have to find everything in the Bible? Think about that for a moment. They are trying to make a statement that everything has to be found explicitly stated in the Bible before we believe it. Correct? That's the whole point. If you can't find purgatory in the Bible, where is it in the Bible? If you can't show it to me right now, chapter and verse, then it's not true because you made it up as a tradition. But they are saying that everything has to be found in the Bible, but if the Bible is their source for everything, then I want them to show me where in the Bible it says they have to find everything in the Bible, which they cannot find. Therefore, it under pit knocks their argument right out from under them, and now they're scrambling through Scripture to try and find out where they can show you something that you just asked them. And they'll come to John, uh, 1 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture's inspired, and this is what they'll say and is profitable for correction and reproof. It doesn't say that it's the only source. It just says that scripture is inspired and it is profitable to do these things. Well, great. In Ephesians, it says that the apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers also are profitable to do the same things that scripture does. The scriptures are not, they are the infallible inspired word of God, but nowhere does it say they are the only source of authority. And if they use that argument, they've proved too much because when Paul was writing, there was no New Testament yet. And what he was referring to as scripture was only the Old Testament and not the New Testament didn't come yet. So you ask that question, where do you find in the Bible? You have to find everything in the Bible. Because in scripture, you're going to see that there are three sources of tradition, not one. 
Yes, we have sacred tradition. First leg of the stool. Second, we have sacred tradition. Second leg of the stool. What's the third leg of the stool? The magisterium of the church. All three of those are necessary. You remove one and the other two fall. You need three legs of a stool to stand. You move one out of there and the chair falls down. You need all three. Where did they all come from? Let's go back to the very beginning. Mount Moses is at Mount Sinai. He meets God. God introduces himself for the first time by name. Do you realize that? Abraham, Noah, Adam, and Eve, none of them knew God's name. They only called him Elohim, God. Generic name, word for God. But Moses had the audacity to say, what's your name? You know, you could be around someone for a long time, and if you don't know their name, you really don't know them. You are still a stranger if you just meet them, talk to them. When they introduce themselves by name, what happens? They become vulnerable. They become known to you. It's like they open up. Now you know them. Names are important. If you don't think names are important, go up to somebody named George and say, Hello, Fred. How are you today? You'll see how my name's important. God introduced himself to Moses for the first time to humanity by name. Moses said, If I go to tell Pharaoh who sent me, who should I say sent me? And God says, Tell them, I am that I am sent you. I am. I am existence. You tell them I am sent you. That is my name through all of eternity. So Jesus, God introduces himself by name. And then Mount Moses goes up on the mountain. And he meets with God for 40 days. And he comes down from the mountain. And what does Moses have? You ask any Jewish rabbi, and he'll tell you Moses had three things. He had the written word of God on stone. He had the oral tradition, what God had taught him orally, that was not written down and never was. And he had the teaching authority that God gave him. He had those three things. He had the written word of God, the oral tradition, and he was the magisterium. He was the teaching office of Israel. And it says that Moses took his seat, his cathedra, Exodus chapter 18. Moses took his seat and he judged the people. And I have a Protestant commentary. It's one of the most authoritative, well-respected, and used commentaries in the Protestant world. Kyle and Dalich. And it says that God, okay, I just love the way he writes this because I couldn't have said it better. And I just loved it, that he says it this way. God gave Moses the gift of infallible interpretation. If they would know that a Catholic would use that, they would retract that and say it another way. But in my book, Upon This Rock, I have that quote in there because I found it very interesting that Protestant theologians would say this. But Moses came down with the word of God in stone, the word of God in tradition, and the teaching authority of Moses. And it was called the chair. The chair of Moses. If I was a Jew up here teaching you today scripture, I wouldn't be standing. I'd be sitting. Because sitting represents the teaching authority of Moses among the Jews. And even there was a tradition in the time of Jesus when he was in Israel. Every synagogue had a stone chair up here. And the scribes and the Pharisees, when they taught in the synagogues, would sit in the stone chair and they would teach. And therefore Jesus says... In Matthew 23, verse 2, the scribes and the Pharisees, they sit in the chair of Moses, therefore do whatever they tell you. Did you know that verse was in there? Isn't that interesting? The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the chair of Moses. This is a tradition that even Jesus accepts. Jesus knows that from the time of Moses, there's been a chair. And when the leaders of Israel sit in the chair and teach, they're teaching the word of God. You are to obey them. Don't do what they do because they're hypocrites. But do what they teach you. <clears throat> the rabbis taught that God gave Moses the Torah, the law, on Mount Sinai. And Moses passed it on to Joshua. Joshua passed it on to the judges. The judges passed it on to the prophets. The prophets passed it on to the general assembly, like the Sanhedrin. And then Jesus comes and he says, you guys haven't used this well. Now I'm coming. I'm establishing a new Israel. The new Israel is going to encompass the whole earth, not just 8,000 square miles of the land of Israel. Now the, church, the, the Israel, I'm creating a new Israel now. It's going to include the whole world. The new covenant is going to include the whole world. And there's no longer the chair of Peter. I mean, Moses, it's now going to become the chair of who? Peter. Peter takes that position of interpreter. So the, the Jews had three-legged stool 
of authority. And since the church builds off of Israel, what would a Jewish person who converts to, well, actually, they don't convert. You know, I was at a conference last weekend, and there was two Jewish women there who were just, had become Catholics, and they were so excited. They were crying through my talks, and they just, I could tell if I just stopped for a minute, they'd stand up and start singing and dancing. They were so excited to be Catholics. And they said, I told how we were all converts, and they said, we're not converts. You're all converts, you Gentiles. We're Jews. We're not converts. We're just fulfilled Jews. We just followed our Jewish Messiah. We didn't convert to anything. But the Jews, if you were a Jewish convert, if you were one who followed the Messiah and you knew your whole tradition and the whole beginning of your authority where you come from was sacred scripture, tradition, and the teaching authority of Moses, what would you expect the church to be, which is now just a fulfillment of Judaism? Would you expect it to be a book alone, or would you expect this also to be a three-legged stool? The sacred scriptures, the sacred tradition, and not the chair of Moses, but the chair of Peter. Doesn't that make perfect sense that there would be a three-legged stool, that there would be tradition? Tradition defines and informs Scripture. Scripture sets, the, scripture sets the standard or the infallible, actually the canon means the rule, the law. And then you need the magisterium to interpret it. When Jesus went up into heaven, and the last thing you saw was the bottom of his sandals as he went up into the clouds. And by the way, one of the silliest questions I think in the Bible was asked that day. You imagine your friend is always on the ground. And then one day you're talking to him after three years of having him always on the ground. And all of a sudden he starts going up, 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 up. And you're looking up and you're up. He, went, he goes up into a cloud and he's gone. And you're standing there looking and then these three men in white come and say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand there looking up? <laughs> what do you th why do you think where he just went up into the clouds? A silly question. The point was is he's going to come back the same way. But when Jesus went up into the clouds, Jesus did not yell back down, Oh, and don't forget to read my book. <laughs> this is a significant point, because did Jesus ever mention there was going to be a book? The New Testament. I'm referring to the New Testament. We always know there's this, the Old Testament scriptures. But did anybody know there was going to be a book added to the Old Testament scriptures? Did Jesus say anything about writing? Did Jesus ever write anything down himself? No. Only he wrote in the sand, didn't he, in John chapter 8. And he came in the book of Revelation and told John to write down this revelation. And John wrote down the book of Revelation. But what about Philemon? And Hebrews, we don't even know who wrote Hebrews. He didn't yell down, read the book. What did Jesus leave? Did he leave us a library? Did he leave us a tradition? What did Jesus leave us? He left us 12 men. He left us 12 men. He had trained them and taught them and said, the Holy Spirit's going to come down on you and he will bring to your remembrance all that I have taught you. That promise isn't for you and me. It was for those 12 who were going to give the public revelation that was going to become the standard, the basis for everything we believe. <clears throat> and those 12 men, Jesus chose and he put Peter at the head. He says, I will give you the keys. And what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. You know, we hear those words, what should be bound on earth, what is bound on earth will be bound in heaven. What is loose on earth will be loose in heaven. We hear that at Mass and just kind of went in one ear and right out the other. Nobody stops to think of what that means. When Jesus gave Peter this authority, he gave him the authority. These were words used among the Jews in their courts and in their synagogues and in their Sanhedrin. To bind meant that the Jewish rabbis and scribes, the priests, the leaders of the Jewish people had the authority from God to bind you to certain things. You can't eat meat on Friday. We are binding you to that. And then if we're going to change, we loose you from that. We bound you now. We can loose. The church had, the Jewish rabbis had the authority from God to bind people to certain conduct and behavior and laws and then to loose them from it. It was the ability to make laws and they also judged them. The bind and loose meant that you could accept someone into the community or to 
excommunicate them out of the community. The power to forgive sins, the power to claim to say you're clean. So this was a power given to them. This is one that they had. Jesus took it away from them, and who did he give it to? Peter and the apostles. So Jesus, when he left, didn't leave a book or a tradition, never even said there was going to be a book. He left 12 men. And those 12 men went out and taught under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's called the public revelation. They taught in scripture and they taught in tradition. Paul wrote and said in 2 Thessalonians 2.15, Hold fast to the traditions that I left you, whether they are in writing or by word of mouth. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, I commend you for holding fast to the traditions that I left you. Now there's a Bible called the NIV. Most Protestant churches, evangelicals, use the NIV, now the Inter New International Version. And whenever the word tradition is used in a bad way, they use the English word tradition. Whenever the Greek word for tradition is used in a good way, they change it to teaching. So when you're reading their Bible, the only time you ever see tradition is when it's bad. But in the Greek, the word is paradosis. And it is sometimes used bad if it's the traditions of men. And sometimes it's used good if it's the traditions of God. And the word tradition simply means handing something on. Have you ever heard this song? Happy birthday to you. You sing that to your family, right? Where did it come from? Your parents handed it on to you, didn't they? And their parents handed it on to them. And someday your kids are going to have kids, and they have kids, and they're going to sing happy birthday to you. And they're going to say, where'd you get that from? I don't know. It came from grammar. That's a tradition. Happy birthday song is a tradition. It's something we hand on. That's as simple as it is, all tradition is. Tradition is not good or bad. Tradition is neutral. Tradition is like a hammer. With a hammer, I can do something good, like build a house. With a hammer, I can do something bad, like crush your skull. Is the tradition itself good or bad? Is a hammer itself good or bad? No. A hammer is neutral. Tradition is neutral. How you use a tradition determines whether it's a good or a bad tradition. If you use a tradition to nullify the word of God, to do bad things, to, to uh, teach things falsely, then it's bad. If you hand on something to your children which is good, then it's a good tradition. That's all it means. The tradition in the church is what has been handed on by the apostles. And the apostles did not originally write things down in became scriptures. First they had just the men who taught. They taught authoritatively from God, sat in the chair of Peter, had the authority to bind and loose, and held the keys of the kingdom. I hope we have time to talk about the keys of the kingdom before I'm done tonight. And those men went out and taught under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, unique from any other men. Those 12, when they wrote and taught, it was the word of God. Paul joined them. He was made an apostle as well. And then their, some of their teaching got into writing. And then that writing became the written part of the tradition. If you imagine tradition as a big circle, all the sacred tradition, the scriptures are part of that. They are a circle within the circle. And it became the inspired word of God. Now you have a three-legged stool. The 12 men who Jesus left, they gave a teaching and a tradition, and they celebrated the Eucharist in a certain way, and all of that became the sacred tradition. And then you had some of their writings and teachings got written down, and that became sacred scripture. And there you have the three-legged stool. Now, Martin Luther came along, and he didn't like this arrangement. He said, you know what? I don't like the Pope anymore. We're going to throw the Pope away. We don't like the tradition anymore. We're going to throw the tradition away. And the way I described it in my movie back there, The Apostolic Fathers, which is, I talk about all of this. The whole first part is about scripture and tradition and authority. I built a three-legged stool. And I'm sitting on this three-legged stool. I say, the Jewish people and the church all had a three-legged stool, tradition, scripture, and the magisterium. And so it stood. And I picked the stool up, but I said, if you take one leg and you rip off the Pope and you throw him away, and then you rip off the tra tradition and throw that away, what do you have left? The Bible alone. That's where it came from, this phrase, sola scriptura, or the Bible alone, because you rip two legs off the stool and throw them away. Then I put the stool back down. I say, now, with the Bible alone, let's see if this works. And I sit on the stool, and I went right over on my back and fell on the ground. And from the ground with dust going up in the air, I said, a stool needs three legs to stand, and that's the way God made his church too.
You take one away, you lose the others. I had used earlier the example of interpreting scripture. This, this, uh, this afternoon I told my conversion story. That one of the reasons that we converted was because I saw the problems within Protestantism. Who interprets the Bible? Who has the final authority to interpret the Bible? Nobody does in Protestantism. There is nobody. Billy Graham is not going to stand up and say, I have the final authority. This. He would never dare do that. James Dobson, as good as he is in many things about raising families and doing good political things in America, he's not going to stand up and say, I'm the Protestant Pope. Charles Stanley, who was head of the, the uh, Southern uh, Baptist Convention and news on the television all the time preaching, he's never going to stand up and say, sometimes they act like it, but he's not going to stand up and say, I'm the final word on these things and what the Bible teaches. And because of this problem, there's all of the different denominations out there. Everybody, we had this idea with the Bible alone. Martin Luther came up with this idea. He says, now that we've got the Bible in the hands of the everybody, now every plowboy and servant girl can read and interpret the Bible for themselves. Isn't this wonderful? The Catholic Church has kept the Word of God from us, kept it in Latin. Now we've got it in the vernacular language, and now every plowboy and servant girl can read it for themselves, and they can find out how to get saved, really. Towards the end of his life, you know what Martin Luther said? Now that he let the cat out of the bag, and there were a whole bunch of people that decided they didn't agree with Martin Luther's interpretation of Scripture, and they broke away and called themselves the Anabaptists. And then the, the Calvin, they went out and started the Reformed, and Zwingli went off and started another group. And pretty soon they're splitting up in every direction. And Martin Luther, before he died, said, there are now as many theologies as there are heads. There are now as many theologies as there are heads. Because when you threw out the teaching authority of the church, when you threw out the pope, you created a billion new popes. And this was a huge problem. The Catholic Church has always understood that the three sources of authority all have to work together. If you have any one without the other, they don't work, it falls. Let's just take a look at the history of the Bible for just a minute. <clears throat> and how the Bible got started. And could you begin a religion based on the Bible alone? Because this is what you hear from the Baptists out there. They don't have the sacred tradition. They don't have the magisterium of the church. They don't have a history. Every Baptist church is an independent congregation. They are not beholden to anyone. I could start my own tomorrow. I don't need any degree or anything else. I could put up a sign, Steve Ray Baptist Church, and if I'm a good enough preacher and I got a warm enough handshake and I give enough services there and I market myself well enough, I can build my own church. And I'm Steve Ray Baptist Church. I'm convinced in the Philippines that I could go to the Philippines and start a church and be a millionaire in five years. Because there are Protestant pastors who retire here and they go to the Philippines and they start their own churches and live like kings. But can you stay? With this idea of the Bible alone, could you build, can you build Christianity on the Bible alone? Well, let's take a look at it. The first hundred years. Could you build a religion based on the book alone in the first hundred years? No, you could not. Why not? Because it wasn't written yet. The New Testament was not written yet. It was in the process of being written. The Gospel of John was not written until after 97 AD. We learn from early history that John wrote his Gospel during the reign of Emperor Trajan, the Roman Emperor. Roman Trajan became Emperor in 97. Paul didn't write his first book until 54 AD. This is 25 years after the death and resurrection of Christ. The first book is written by Paul. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't know the dates, but many think it's second, second half of the first century. All of them were written by in the first century, but some towards the end. So if you are going to build a religion based on a book in the first century, 100 years, it's going to be very difficult because you don't have the book yet, and nobody even said there was going to be a book. Nobody's even anticipating a book. So what did they survive on? How did they know what to do on Sunday morning? How did they know how to get saved? How did they know how to live the Christian life? And don't think they didn't know because this was the generation that was taken into the Roman Colosseum and they stood there while lions charged at them and the emperor would say, recant and deny your Christ and we'll let you go. And they said, we will not deny our Christ. We are Christians. Rawr! The lions pounced on them and ate everything and only left big pieces of bone. 
How did they have that courage to follow Christ without a New Testament? The Bible alone. What did they have? They had the apostles. They had the teaching authority of the church. And they already had the sacred tradition beginning. And the sacred tradition was preserved by who? The bishops. In my movie, Apostolic Fathers, you see this armored truck driving up. And the first thing you say, oh no, what's Steve doing now? And the armored truck drives up in front of a bank. And the doors open. And I get out with $2 million in my hands and two bags. And I get out of the truck, and I go into the bank, and I have the armed guard go in with me. And we go into the bank, and I open the safe. I put the $2 million in the safe, and I shut the door, and I said, what did I just do? I did the same thing the apostles did. The apostles were like a rich man who took the great deposit of faith, and he deposited in the bank of the church. This is what they did. They took the great deposit of the faith, all that Jesus had given to them, those 12 men, and they went to the bank, the church, and they deposited it in the church. Now, who is in charge of taking care of that deposit? It is the, those who have succeeded the apostles, the bishops. It is their job to preserve and to promulgate that tradition, what was taught and what was deposited. So what they had in the first century was not a book. It wasn't even written yet. What they had was a tradition. Hold fast to the traditions I left you, Paul said. I was there. You saw what I did on Sunday morning. I taught you how to live your life. I taught you how to get saved. I taught you what to do. Follow my tradition. That which I handed on to you. Paradosis. Do this. Now the second generation. Did they have a Bible that they could... Let's say from the years 200, 300, those... Next 200 years, the 200s and the 300s. Did they have the ability now to have a religion based on a book alone? No, because it was now the documents were written, but who know which one who knew which ones they were? There are over 300 documents from those centuries that claim to be from the apostles. The Proto-Evangelium of James, the Gospel of, he of Peter, the Gospel of Paul, the Acts of Peter and Paul. You've heard of the Gospel of Thomas, right? And the Gospel of Judas. Remember, big deal with National Geographical. We just discovered this new thing. Shows how stupid they were because in the second century they already wrote about the Gospel of Judas and and condemned it as heretical. So what is National Geographic trying to do? Thing like they just discovered this thing. Do your homework. Saint Irenaeus wrote about it in the second century. So now you have over 300 documents claiming to be by the apostles. Nobody knows which ones really are by the apostles. And let me ask you this question. If we shut these doors right now and we had police around here and said nobody's leaving this room until we decide which one of these are the inspired word of God, we have 300 of them. We're going to lay them all out on the ground here. And we're not leaving this room until we decide which ones of these are inspired word of God and which ones are not. Which ones are you going to be willing to die for? And which ones will you give to the Roman authorities if they ask for them? And which ones can you read at Mass? How many of you feel qualified to make that determination? Oh, we'll call on the Holy Spirit. He'll help us. There's 300 of them. First of all, we have to figure out how many of them are there out of 300. Nobody's going to tell you that number yet. Nobody knew. There's 27. I'll give you a hint. Now, when you start doing your work to decide which ones of these are inspired, let me ask you a simple question. How many of you know ancient Greek? Oh, we're in big trouble. But this is what happened for the next 200 years in the church. They had these documents, but no one knew which ones belonged in the book. And there was discussion, and there was argument about it. And some churches in the East rejected the book of Revelation and Hebrews. Others rejected, uh, kept those, and they included Clement and Shepherd of Hermes. And there was different collections of New Testaments around. A man named Marcion only accepted the writings of Paul and rejected the others. Then there were others that accepted only the original apostles and said Paul was an interloper. Who's he? He's not one of the original 12. And nobody knew which books belonged in the New Testament. It wasn't until the end of the 4th century before we had a final collection of books. And how did that get decided? by the councils of the Catholic Church with the ratification of the popes that these 27 books can be read at Mass. For 400 years it was between the time Jesus resurrected and they had a final canonical collection of books. Do you know how long ago that is? Think of when did the pilgrims come here on the Mayflower? Long time ago? That's the time 
distance in time between the resurrection of Christ and we had a final closed New Testament. Did you know that? That is the distance of time when the early Christians had no final New Testament. My dad, when we were kids driving to church, my dad would say, Steve, see those people going to that church? They're not really Christians, son. How do you know, Dad? Look, not one of them is carrying the Bible under their arms. Now over there, son, those are real Christians. How do you know, Dad? Look at every one of them is carrying the Word of God. What would my dad have had to judge for all those Christians in the first four centuries? That they weren't Christians because they did not have a New Testament to carry to church with them. What did they do when they got to church? They heard the readings up here because they didn't have them. Now let's look at the next thousand years. Now we know that there are 27 books in the New Testament. Do you have your own Bible now? Can now finally that we know they're there and collected. Now let's start a religion based on a book alone. It didn't work. You know why? Could you afford a Bible back then? A Bible in the Middle Ages from the year 400 until 1500 would have costed you the equivalent of three years wage. Because they didn't have paper. And they didn't have Xerox. You can go on your computer right now and you could say print and you could print the whole Bible. It may take a couple hours, but in a couple hours you could have the whole Bible printed off your computer. Go to the office supply and get lots of paper. But they didn't have paper then. They didn't have printing machines. And if you wanted a Bible, you needed to have the skins of 1,000 sheep or deer. How many of you have a thousand sheep or deer you're wanting to kill right now so that you have the vellum to make the pages of your Bible? You can make it out of papyrus. That was the plant in Egypt. You had the option of papyrus or vellum, plant or animal skins. If you went the, the uh, papyrus route, much cheaper, easier to get much cheaper, but as soon as it gets wet, or it gets in the wrong climate of humidity, it will disintegrate in a very short time. Are you willing to pay a man or a woman three years wages to copy out the whole Bible by hand on papyrus, which is going to disintegrate in a few years? No. If you want to write the Bible, you're going to get vellum, which is animal skin. And it's going to take 900 to 1,000 deer or animals. And I have some of these pages at home. I bought them on eBay, so I have an example of them. And you would have somebody then hire them to write all the Bible out by hand, which would take about three years. I went to the second oldest library, second biggest library in the world. I've been to the one in Vatican, but the one out in uh, Mount Sinai. And he had all the Bibles were bound in leather. All the books, the ancient books on vellum were bound in leather. And I just asked the stupid question, why, did, why are they all bound in leather? He said, because they're animal skins. And if left to themselves, they'll go back to the shape that they were on the animal. <laughs> so you got the rump, you know. It's Romans chapter 5 on the, on the rump piece. And all of a sudden, whoop, it looks back like the cows behind her. So they had the animal skins. Everything was printed on that. Three years wages if you wanted a Bible in that period of a thousand years. Could you build a religion based on a book? Could all of you have your own Bible to go home and read and interpret it for yourself? No, you couldn't because you didn't have a Bible. And another thing is that only one out of ten people could read. So if you're going to build a religion based on a book alone, who can read it? One out of ten people. What about the other nine? They all go to hell. They don't know that. They have, don't have the book. Even today in the world, the estimates are 50% of the world is illiterate. In Detroit alone, 50% of the people are illiterate. In Detroit. In public schools, one out of five graduates unable to read. So even today to have a book based on the Bible alone or a book alone is a bad idea because not everyone could read it. But for that thousand years, only one out of, one out of ten could read. Now, I was always taught that the Catholic Church had statues and icons and stained glass, and these are all a violation of the command not to have statues and images. Those Catholics have those in their churches. Do you know why the Catholics had those in their churches? Because they were called the gospel of the poor. You didn't have a Bible at home. 
If you wanted to know the stories of the Bible, grandmother would bring her little grandchildren into the church, and there she would talk, show them the stained glass and the statues and the paintings and the icons, and she would say, see here, oh, that lady's very fat. She's riding on a donkey. Yes, that's Mary. She is pregnant with Jesus, the Word of God. And she'd go through the whole story of the Bible and the stained glass. The gospel of the poor, they cannot read. They don't have a Bible at home. And then they come to the statue of the man hanging on a cross with nails in his hand. And the little girl says, Grandma, why are they being so mean to that man? Why did they put nails in his hands? And then she says, that's Jesus. He died on the cross for us. See his shed blood? That's the blood that took away our sins. And she explained, it's the gospel of the poor. And when you came to the Mass and you heard the readings of the Sunday, for example, we just went to Mass, we heard the readings. How would you listen differently to the readings if you didn't have a Bible at home and you didn't have access to the Bible or to libraries or to the Internet? How would you listen to the readings at Mass differently if you were illiterate and couldn't read? And knowing that that may be the only time in your life that you hear that particular passage of Scripture, how would you listen to it differently? The gospel of the poor was in the church. And I heard when I grew up that the, that the Catholics kept the Bibles chained to the Pope, to the podium up here. And then they had a big screen here of metal to keep you from getting up here. And the Bibles were chained so that you couldn't get them. Ah, that way the priest could keep you by the throat. And he kept it in a language called Latin so that you wouldn't understand it. Only he would. Because if you ever understood what the Bible said and you got it in your own language and you got the copy and you could take it home, you would find out the Catholic Church was really the whore of Babylon and the Pope was the Antichrist and you could really find your way to get saved. This is what I was taught. Even in Switzerland, I had a, professor, a great theologian that I loved he took us to a church and he showed us, see up here in the rock, See where there looks like something was ripped out. Yes, I see that. He said there used to be a fence here. And up on this side was the word of God. And on that side was the people. And this great fence was there to keep people from the word of God. Oh, that's terrible. I found out something different when I began to do my homework. Do you know why that screen was there? And why the Bible was chained to the podium? Very good. How much was a Bible worth? Oh, it's a collector's item. If a Bible is worth three years' wages, that's the equivalent, usually, of the mortgage on your house, what your house is worth, what it was worth five years ago, not now. What is your house worth? That's what it would have cost you, three years' wages, to buy a Bible. And if a Bible is worth that much and you just leave it laying around, guess what's going to happen? It's gone. They chained them to the podiums in the churches, not so that you couldn't get to them, but so that there would always be one here for you to get to. I found out that in the universities of England and France, when you wanted to study Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, you went to the library, and guess what? All of those manuscripts were chained to the tables in the libraries. Why? Because they were rare. They were expensive. And in order to make sure that the university students already always had a copy, they chained them to the table so there would always be a copy there. This book, book was chained up here not to keep you from it, but so that there would always be one there for the good deacon to read to you on Sunday morning. And on top of that, the fence that was there was also there to protect the book. And I heard that Catholics burned the Bible. Isn't that terrible? Burning the Word of God? That's sacrilegious. The Catholic Church, I found out, did burn the Bible. And the reason it burned it is because it loved it. What kind of sense does that make? I go to use bookstores a lot because I love buying books, especially old books you can't buy anymore. Some of them are better than books you can buy today. And so I always go and look in the used bookstores, and there's always, go to the Bible section, and there's some Bibles there that I buy, and I take them home and I burn them. I have a fire pit in the back of our yard. We burn, we burn a lot of our trash. 
And you say, you can't do that. And a couple times I actually brought one of these Bibles that showed you. I lit it on fire up here, and I quit doing it because once it set off the smoke detectors, and then I quit doing that. I don't do it anymore. But I bring those Bibles home, and I burn them. And people said, you shouldn't do that, Steve, until I tell them what it is. It says on the cover, the New World Translation of Sacred Scripture. And you read in John chapter 1 that the Word was with God and the Word was a God. Those Bibles that I buy are the Jehovah's Witnesses Bibles, and I bring them back home and burn them so nobody else will pick one up and be deceived by it. Why did the Catholic Church burn Bibles? Because during the rebellion, which is called the Protestant Reformation, they were translating the Bible, and the Protestants were doing this in opposition to the Catholic Church, and they were changing words, and Martin Luther was adding the word alone, saved by faith alone, which we'll talk about tomorrow, and they were adding comments and notes, which were heretical, and the Catholic Church, because she is in charge of the scriptures, it is her job to take care of the scriptures, she went out and got those scriptures, and she burned them, because she is in charge of making sure her children have pure milk. So this thousand years, you could not have your own Bible. So now we're talking for the first 1,500 years of Christianity, there was no Bible alone. You couldn't build a religion based on it. These people that talk about the Bible alone and you have to have the Word of God to be a real Christian are so anachronistic and out of touch with reality that it almost makes me, it would be funny if it wasn't so sad. They don't even know where their Bible came from. Ask them, where did your Bible came from? The Holy Spirit gave it. To of course, Holy Spirit. But through what process? They don't know where it came from. Now, Martin Luther comes along, but simultaneously comes the printing press. Gutenberg invents the printing press. What was the first book printed on the printing press? A Catholic Bible. I was told that Martin Luther finally got the Bible into the language of the German people so they could read it for themselves. And no one told me that the Catholic Church had already provided 13 editions of the Bible in German before Martin Luther was ever born. Now Martin Luther says, let's publish these and get them out in their heretical editions. Nobody uses the, the Bibles that Luther and Tyndale and Wycliffe printed now. They were so full of errors, they counted sometimes to 100 on a, two pages of errors. And so nobody uses those. But they said, let's get it out into the hands of the people. Now, can you start a religion based on a book alone? Sorry. What happened then was everybody started to read it for themselves and come up with their own interpretations. Martin Luther said something funny. He was very sacrilegious. He said something funny. These people now, they read the Bible all for themselves and they think they know everything. They swallowed the Holy Ghost, feathers and all. And so you have now this everybody's interpreting it for themselves. And you can see in that 500 years from then to today where we've gotten. You go up and down any street of America and you see all these denominations and they all have the same idea. We have the book. Who wrote the book? The Holy Spirit is the author of the book. And where does he live? In me. How cool. I read the book who the author lives inside of me so he interprets it for me as I read. Good idea. There's truth to that, by the way. But if you leave it at that and you say there's no tradition to inform you of what it means and then there's no teaching authority to tell you the definition, the, the final interpretation of it, then everybody's going to go off in their own direction and have all their own ideas about what the Bible teaches and what it means. Now, we have the Pope. Where did this idea come from? We talked a little bit about scripture and about tradition. Where did the idea of the Pope come from? Well, Martin, I'll, I'll start all the way back. Martin Luther threw him away took the stools, the legs off the stool. But from the very beginning, there was a chair of Moses. And he had the teaching authority. He taught the people of God. He judged them day and night and told them what God wanted them to do. And then when Jesus comes, he takes this authority away and he gives that authority to Peter and to the apostles. And I do a talk. It's an over an hour long. It's back there called Peter, the Rock, the Keys, and the Chair. And it's also in my movie on Peter back there. At Caesarea Philippi, I said, you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And people don't know this until they go there, and even 99 out of 100 people that go there never hear this. But when you go there, there is a rock in Caesarea Philippi, and in the rock is a cave. This is a huge rock, 50 feet high or more and 500 feet wide, a huge rock. And in the rock on the left-hand side is a cave, and in front of that cave was a big white temple, and the temple was to the divine Caesar Augustus, 
And the pagans would come to this place to worship and declare Caesar as Lord and to worship pagan gods. And this was a huge rock. It was where pagans came to worship with a false church in front of it. And they would take their, their living sacrifices and they'd walk through, through this big white like a church, it was a pagan temple made out of imported marble, and they would walk through the temple with their living sacrifice, I don't know if it was human or animal or both, and they would throw it into the cave, and in the cave there was water at the bottom, and there you could not find the bottom. Josephus in the first century said, many have taken a string with a, a stone, and they've lowered it down and down and down into the cave, and there's no bottom. So guess what they called this cave? The gates of Hades. The entrance to the netherworld, the gates of hell. And so they would throw these down into there and they would be giving these living sacrifices to the gods down in the gate, the, into the entrance of Hades. And if there was the, the water that came flowing out and it's still there today when I take you to Caesarea Philippi, you see the water flowing out from that rock. And it's the headwaters of the Jordan River. It's the source of the Jordan River, the main source. And if you threw the living sacrifice in and that blood showed up in the water, it meant the gods down below had rejected your sacrifice and sent the blood out. It's the opposite in Christianity. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so they would come and throw these in. And so here you're dealing with this rock, with the church, and the gates of hell. Guess what? How many of you knew this? When you read, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You have here a false rock with a false church, with a false sacrifice to a false Lord. And Jesus says, we're starting over. We're now going to have the true rock, Peter, and the true church that I'm going to build. And it'll be to the true, a true offering, the altar here, to the true Lord himself. And then there was even more. There's next to that, on, the, on this side, from your perspective, there are niches carved in the wall, in the rock. Big car, car, they're arched at the top and flat at the bottom. And some of them are huge, 10 feet high almost. And all the time people want to stand in there and get their picture taken like they're one of the gods. And the main god worshipped there was the god Pan. In fact, we read in the Bible that they went to Caesarea Philippi, but it wasn't called that earlier, and it's not called that today. It's called Panias. Today it's called Banias because Arabs can't make the P sound. When they try to say P, P, it comes out B, B. So they, we call Papa. The Pope is Papa. They call him Baba. So the city of Panias became now the city of Banias, and the city of Panias was the city of Pan. And what was Pan the god of? The god of sheep and shepherds. Think what Jesus is doing with Peter right now. False church, false rock, false lord, false worship, and a false god of sheep and shepherds. I am now the, good, the true shepherd of the sheep, and I'm appointing you to be my shepherd. And here are the keys of the kingdom to be the shepherd of my sheep. All of this is right there at Caesarea Philippi Banias. I could take you there and show it to you. It's in my movie back there. And if people understood this, they would never leave the Catholic Church. This was appointed that Peter would be the rock. He would have the keys. And what do the keys represent? I thought I understood what the keys represent. But the Pope has given the keys. They mean, I thought they meant, that I could open the gates of heaven for you Catholics because I had the gospel. The gospel were the keys. And if I would take the keys, I could open up the gates of heaven by preaching you the gospel of accepting Jesus. Ask him in your heart leave the Catholic Church, now I just open the gates of heaven for you. That's what the keys are. But that's not what the keys are. I was thinking like an American with my Baptist glasses on. What do keys represent? They represented something very different. When Jesus said to Peter, I will give you the keys, it's singular you. Now you down here, you have this wonderful way of saying you. If it's one person, it's you. If it's a couple people, it's y'all. And if it's a lot of people, it's all y'all. And I'm trying to get this established in Michigan, but it's not working. I'm, I'm not having much success with it. I like it, though. I'm beginning to use it because it is much more descriptive when you say something. Jesus did not say when he talked to the apostles, I'm giving all y'all the keys. <laughs> he gave the keys to you, Peter. And Peter had the keys. The keys represented exclusive dominion of the kingdom of God. Because in those days, the king had a royal steward. And the royal steward was second in command to the king. 
And when you read about the keys of the kingdom, you can't think about it like an American. You have to think about it like a Jew. What did the Jews think? They knew their history. The king always had a royal steward. And there's one set of keys for the kingdom that opened the front gates and the royal treasury and everything else. And the royal steward carried those keys around. And they were big two-by-four keys. They weren't the little keys we had. They are big two-by-four keys. And he carried those around and it said everybody in Jerusalem would bow to him. They called him the father of Jerusalem. He had a special office. And it says that with the keys, he carried the keys of the kingdom. And what he opened, no man would shut. And what he shut, no man would open. Isaiah 22, verse 22. Jesus is not talking in a vacuum. It's all based on his history. Jesus becomes the king of Israel. The angel said to Mary, your, your son will sit on the throne of his father David. He will be a king. And Jesus is the king. And before he leaves, he appoints his royal steward Peter who is going to carry the keys of the kingdom to represent the king while he's gone that's what the keys are they represent exclusive dominion I cannot go right now and get in your car and go take your house over because you own the keys for them but if I say I want to go there you can give me the keys and delegate them on vacation go to my house and take care of it now I can go to your house and take over your house for a month the keys of the kingdom represent exclusive dominion and Jesus gave them to Peter and Peter since that point has been the head of the church and for 265 popes they have never taught error and they are still sitting on the chair of Peter today and the, Ro the Roman Empire collapsed and fell and I'm finished with this line the Roman I see him getting closer and closer bad deacon and the, the Roman Empire rose and fell and there was a man sitting on the chair of Peter the Byzantine Empire rose and fell Still a man on the chair of St. Peter. The Ottoman Empire rose and fell. Still a man on the chair of St. Peter. The British Empire rose and fell. Still a man on the chair of St. Peter's. And someday America is on rise and fall. And the way things are going now, it might be sooner than I had hoped. And when that falls, there will still be a man on the chair of St. Peter. And who knows what's next? The Muslims or China? And when the next empire comes, until the end of time, there will be a man sitting on the chair of Peter. It is the oldest existing institution or office in the world. Nothing has outlasted the papacy. And the papacy will be on, there will be a man seated on the throne of God, on the throne of Peter, teaching all the way from... By the way, right now it's been 3,500 years because when Peter took it over, it was already 1,500 years old from Moses. So Benedict sits on a chair that's been there for 3,500 years and they've never taught error. And there will be a man on the chair of Peter that you can trust because the Holy Spirit oversees it until the time, until Jesus comes back again. And now we've talked about scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, and you'll know why I'm a Catholic, and I'm sure glad I'm not a Protestant anymore. Thank God. Blessed be God forever. Amen. See you tomorrow. Afternoon.